I have reviewed many wheel sets recently, but none have had a wider internal width as these scope wheels at 23 millimeters. So not only am I intrigued to look over these wheels in general, I'm intrigued to see how the tire profile of these 28 millimeter GP5000 tires compares to the same tire on a narrower internal rim width. There is also the small detail of setting up these wheels tubeless, which I've not actually done before. The thing is, it's not even near. I'll also look at the lateral and the radial trueness of the wheels and compare them to all the other wheels that I have tested so far on this channel. So let's get straight into it. I feel excited. Now when Scope sent me these wheels for review, I was intrigued to see how they would perform in comparison to sort of cheaper Chinese carbon wheel sets if you like or wheels you can buy direct from Asia. On first impressions, these wheels are very sleek. In my opinion, the less something tries to shout at you, the more sophisticated it actually looks. I'm a big fan of the subtle, more sophisticated approach. If you do want fancy loud decals though, you can add some customization. Anyone for a rainbow colored logo. Now looking over the wheels, I couldn't see any sort of imperfections. Everything was looking good. Also the carbon has a nice look, a nice finish and a good shimmer in the light. Now just looking by eye and handling these wheels, they do actually feel quite wide. Now we'll measure them properly later and see, but on first impressions, they sort of feel chunky and thick. In the box, there was also this little spacer, which I believe is to accommodate a smaller 10 speed cassette. Now the wheels are already set up tubeless, so the tubeless valve is installed as well as the tubeless rim tape, which is nice, saves you doing that if you're setting them up tubeless. Now we have them out of the box, we can take a look at the sizing. Now first things first, we can chuck them in the true and stand which I bought from AliExpress. Now at this point, I'd like to let you know that I am a fully trained engineer with the most accurate tools known to man. Yeah, that's sarcasm. Obviously, there are more sophisticated ways to do this, but in this video, I'm just trying to give you a general idea, so keep that in mind. You're completely useless. For those of you new to rim measurements, I can show you this image, which is a cross section of a rim. So imagine you have cut the rim in half and you're looking at it side on, the cross section. So we have the depth, so that's a side profile essentially. This is the main measurement given with deep section wheels. Around 80 mil would be pretty deep. Around 25 mil would be pretty shallow. Then we have the inner width. This is the distance inside of the rim under the hook. Now for road wheels, 23 mil, like these wheels, is pretty wide and 19 mil would deem to be narrow these days. Then we have the outer width, which is the external measurement. This is obviously dependent on the inner width. So the depth of these wheels is advertised at 57 millimeters. When we measured the front in a few different locations, we got 57.9, 57.5 and 57.6. So a slightly larger measurement than advertised. I forgot to measure the back because like I said, I'm a professional. Now we can look at the inner rim width, which is probably the most significant measurement on these wheels because they are acclaimed 23 mil, which is wide for a road bike wheel set. Now for the front wheel, we have measurements of 23.4, 23.2, 23.3 and 23.4 again. Now we can swap the wheels over again quickly in the stand and do the same thing for the rear. And that gave us 23.3, 23.3, 23.4 and 23.4. But why does this measurement matter so much? What is the importance? Now, from my understanding, a wider rim like this will spread the tire beads further apart. This typically creates a more rounded tire profile which can enhance the tire performance by providing like a more uniform contact patch with the road. In layman's terms, your tire should be less like a mushroom and more like an oval. Generally, they say a wider rim with the same tire profile offers improved handling. The tire sidewalls are better supported, reduce tire roll during cornering, yada, yada, yada. We will try it all out when we ride these wheels. Apparently there is aerodynamic gains to consider as well. Ideally the tire width should be a closer match with the actual rim width. Whether or not it would make a notifiable difference for the average cyclist in the sort of real world scenario, I don't know, but the logic makes sense in my head. I also measured the outer width just for reference. It's not the easiest thing to get an accurate measurement on. That gives us an average of 30.3, so slightly above the claimed 30 millimeters. For the spokes on these scope wheels, we have the Sapim CX sprint spokes, which are bladed on both the front and rear wheels. That means they are not circular from top to bottom. Instead, they sort of have a flat spot. They're often referred to as 
aero spokes. Apparently, they are meant to be more aerodynamic. Now, these spokes are straight pull, so they go straight from the hub to the rim. There is no J bend where the spoke attaches to the hub. Now, the spokes are not touching either where they cross. Now, I've seen mixed information online about spokes touching and not touching and how that affects the stiffness and then they can rub and that rubbing can make noise. But it's an interesting topic if you like that sort of techie, nerdy information like me. On the front, we have 14 spokes on the left side. This side is also a two cross pattern, so the spokes cross each other twice. We have seven spokes on the right side. They are radial and they do not cross each other at all. That gives a total amount of spokes of 21. Now on the rear, there are 16 spokes on the drive side, so the right side of the wheel, and these are also a two cross pattern. Now on the left, there are eight spokes and they have a one cross spoke pattern. So a total of 24 spokes, three more than the front. So essentially each side of the front and the rear wheel have a different spoke pattern and a different amount of spokes. I think that is the first time that I have seen that. Now we know what the spokes are and what we're working with, we can check the tension. Now to do this, I have a digital spoke tension tool which basically bends a spoke slightly to give you its tension in a digital readout. Now what I do is I measure each spoke tension and chuck it in the Park Tools spoke tension checker. Now when we look at the readings from the front wheel, you can see that we get the green light. If we change the variance to 5%, we still have the green light. So all good. For the rear, we can then do the same thing. Chuck all the measurements into the app, press the update button, and we have the green tick as well for all the spokes. Again, changing the variance to 5% and we are still green. So all good on the spokes. We can revisit this after a few thousand miles and see if we have the same results. So do subscribe to see that video in the future. Now we can look at the trueness of the wheels. We are going to be looking at the lateral trueness, and that's the sort of side to side variation. Basically, if it wobbles at all, often referred to as being buckled, and also the radial trueness. Now, this is basically how circular the wheels are. To do this, we have some gauges that we will utilize on our wheel stand. Now, one full rotation of the gauge represents one millimeter in total. So if a wheel is out of true by 10 notches on this gauge, that would be 0.1 millimeters, which is minuscule. So keep that in mind. So first the radial trueness, we set up the gauge to press against the rim. Then we can spin the wheel and see if there is a variation and it will push down on the gauge if there is and show us how much variation on the gauge. We can zero the gauge by finding the lowest or highest point, which takes some finding as I'm doing, then spinning the wheel and finding the furthest variation from the zero point. When I did this on the rear wheel, we had 26 notches, which is 0.26 millimeters, pretty good. I can then repeat the same process for the front wheel and that gave us a reading of 0.24. Again, that's pretty damn good. We can then move on to the lateral trueness. The stand also has these prongs you can twist in and out, and this allows you to visually see and also listen out for any variation if there's any scraping. The scraping should sort of be consistent. If it's like a dun, 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 then it's gonna be touching and then moving away, touching and moving away. Now, there is a slight raise in the decal, which can throw things off a little, so keep that in mind, but overall, it seemed pretty good. And with the gauge set up, we can then see the deviation is 0.16 millimeters, which is very low indeed. I can do the same in the front, and again, it's looking pretty good with the visual indication. I actually gave the wheel a real good spin, which helps sort of highlight any wobble. It's quite interesting to see such a close-up shot that would indicate some variance. It looks pretty good by eye, but when I chuck the gauge on for a more accurate measure, it confirmed that it was 0.16. Now here is a spreadsheet of all the wheels that I've tested so far. And with all the numbers chucked in, we can see that the scope wheel set comes in second place for the average deviation across all four measurements. Not bad at all. Now these hubs are the Scope R series hubs. So I'm guessing Scope maybe make these hubs. On both the front and rear, they have steel bearings as well as a diamond ratchet 36 tooth engagement system. And the rear hub felt really smooth, to be honest. Nothing to complain about there. There was no grinding, which you would feel when you actually spin the wheel in your fingers. It's quite a good way to tell. It's also super satisfying because I'm a little odd like that. You are so strange. Now for the traditional free hub test. Now the front normally spins better because there is no free hub getting involved in the action. And these really did feel good. They just sort of spin and spin and spin. Thank you. 
So on to setting these wheels up with these tires so we can then test this 23 mil internal width with a 28 mil tire. And I'm gonna be using these GP5000 TL tubeless 28 mil tires for the task. Now they are a tubeless specific tire and I'm pretty much use GP5000 tires on all my road bikes and wheels. It's worth noting that 28 mil is actually the minimum recommended width for these wheels. So perfect if you're looking for like an all road wheel set. As I said earlier, these wheels come with the tubeless valve and tape installed, so we don't have to worry about that. The first job on the list is to try and stretch these tires out a little, because if you haven't installed tubeless tires before, they are normally pretty tight. And these were no exception. Let's just say that I probably spent around 30, 40 minutes just trying to get the first side of the tire onto the rim. At points, I thought, they were genuinely too tight for the rims. And the thing is, it's not even near. That's when I called in the reinforcements. My wife. With another set of hands, we could massage the tire, pull in any slack around to the final part, and then with some tire levers, which I don't like using on carbon rims, I could get the final part onto the rim. Oh, jeez. 30 minutes to get one side on. Without my wife, I'm not sure I could finish the job. Next, I added the sealant to the bottom of the tire, around 70 millilitres is what they recommend. I added some extra in for good measure. Now I'm using stand sealant. This was recommended to me, so it's what I've been using. Then I can start to install the second part of the tire at the top of the rim. Once some tire is installed, then I can rotate the tire, catch all the sealant in the bottom of the tire, allowing me to focus on installing the top part of the tire onto the rim. Then we were into battle number two because this side was also a pain to get installed. Again, I called in the reinforcements and with the extra set of hands, it was much easier. Maybe there is a better method or maybe this tire and rim combo was particularly tight. Oh, she's in. Yes, that was very tight. I then have this Beto air tank inflator and basically what you do is pump the tank up using a normal track pump. This gives you a tank full of compressed air, which you can pump or release into the tire in one go. It's much quicker and will force the tire to sit on the rim. Now inside the tubeless valve is a valve core. I needed to remove this and what this does is allow more air to go into the tire in one go. I don't have the tool, obviously, I'm a professional. So out came the long nose pliers and a few twists later and it was removed. Next, the Beto tank is fixed to the valve and I can release the air. It looked like the tire had seated all the way around the rim pretty well. I then removed the tank quickly and what I have to do is basically reinsert that valve core, hopefully keeping some pressure. Obviously that didn't go to plan because we're recording and why would it? So all the pressure was released from the tire. I thought that would release the tire from the bead, it would pop off, but the tire remained seated. So I quickly grabbed the track pump and pumped the tire up to 60 PSI. Then I gave it a spin to get all the tubeless sealant to spread around the inside of the tire everywhere. Then I pumped up to 95 PSI, which is the max recommended to help everything seat correctly. Another quick spin, then I released some air so it wasn't at its max. I checked the bead to make sure the sort of tire was seated consistently all the way around on both sides and everything was looking pretty good. But I like to think working on bikes is relaxing and therapeutic, but I'm not sure I can say that about installing these tires. Now with the tires installed, I wanted to see how they compared to the same tire on a wheel with a 21 millimeter internal width. Initial inspection, there doesn't appear to be a vast amount of difference. I'm not sure what I was expecting to be honest. Obviously one tire is new and one tire is around 1000 or 1500 miles used. So I'm going to assume that that would make a difference. When I measured the tire width, there wasn't much difference either. I feel like I'm gonna to have to ride these wheels and try and give sort of some real world feedback and kind of do these measurements after like 1500 miles. So it is a, a definite like for like comparison. Do subscribe because that will be coming soon along with a longer term review of these wheels after I've ridden them in the lovely English sunshine. So thanks for watching if you made it this far and I shall see you in the next one.